Europe's biggest militaries are still shopping for American tanks and fighter jets, but Turkey, after a crippling U.S. arms embargo in 1974, rewired its entire strategy. Today, Turkish factories deliver 80% of the country's arsenal, while most European NATO allies import nearly two-thirds of theirs. Combat-proven Bayraktar drones have shaped five wars, as European rivals struggle to even field prototypes. How did Turkey flip the balance of power? And what does self-reliance actually look like on the battlefield? The chain reaction starts here. The embargo of 1974 sent shockwaves through Turkey's military command. Overnight, spare parts for tanks, jets, and even ammunition vanished from the supply chain. National Security Council records from that year reveal heated debates behind closed doors about whether the country would continue to rely on outside powers or instead chart a new course. The old guard warned of steep costs and long delays. A new generation, led by officers like Keenan Evren, pressed for a future where no Turkish soldier would ever again wait for foreign supplies before going into battle. The decision was not just about pride, it was about survival. Policy documents drafted in the months after the embargo carried a single uncompromising line, as much indigenous production as possible. That mandate was written into government charters and echoed in procurement meetings for the next decade. The message was clear. Turkey would not allow its defense to be held hostage by the decisions of distant allies. Progress came slowly at first. By the early 2000s, Turkey remained dependent on imports for 80% of its military needs. Still, the resolve forged in the embargo years did not fade. In 1985, the government established the Defense Industries Presidency, known in Turkey by its initials SSB. Unlike traditional ministries, the SSB was given sweeping authority. It would oversee procurement, direct research, broker joint ventures, and enforce strict localization targets across every branch of the armed forces. Its founding charter spelled out a singular mission to create a defense industry that could stand alone regardless of political wins abroad. Over the next two decades, the SSB became the engine of Turkey's defense transformation. Localization targets were set, measured, and raised year after year. Factories that once assembled foreign kits began designing their own systems from the ground up. By 2024, the numbers had flipped. More than 80% of Turkey's military equipment was built at home, a mirror image of the dependency that once defined the country's arsenal. Where European NATO states now import nearly two-thirds of their gear, most of it from the United States, Turkey's factories fill the gap with homegrown solutions. That shift matters strategically. 80% localization buys freedom from foreign supply chain vulnerabilities, and it buys strategic autonomy when crises come. This reversal did not happen by accident. It was the product of a national policy forged in crisis, institutionalized by the SSB, and enforced by governments unwilling to repeat past mistakes. The revenge arc that began in 1974 now shapes procurement, research priorities, and industrial policy in Ankara. The embargo that once threatened to cripple the Turkish military has, in the end, produced Europe's most self-sufficient arsenal. Turkey's defense industry now stretches across more than 3,500 companies, supporting over 100,000 jobs and fueling an annual research and development investment that exceeds $3.5 billion. This web of factories, labs, and engineering offices produces everything from precision munitions to armored vehicles. But the clearest proof of its output comes not from spreadsheets, but from the battlefield, the Bayraktar. TB2 is not just a product of scale, it is a product of relentless iteration. Selkuk Bayraktar, an MIT-trained engineer, brought a sprint culture to Baykar that upended the old defense playbook. Engineering teams raced to roll out upgrades, sometimes pushing new software to frontline users within days of receiving field reports. From 2009 to 2015, Baycar ran five or six full engineering sprints each year. This rapid cycle, unheard of among Europe's defense giants, meant that Turkish drones could adapt to battlefield realities at a pace Western programs simply could not match. The result is a drone that has rewritten the rules of war in five different conflicts. In Syria's Idlib province, TB2s blinded and destroyed Russian-made air defenses, clearing the skies for Turkish and allied forces. In Libya, they helped turn the tide in Tripoli by knocking out Pantsir systems and armored columns. In Nagorno-Karabakh, 
Azerbaijan's TB2s devastated Armenian tanks and air defenses, shifting the balance of power in a matter of weeks. In Ukraine, TB2s opened the war by striking Russian convoys and naval assets, even as the threat environment grew fiercer. And in Ethiopia's Tigray War, Turkish drones gave government forces a decisive edge, with UN and OSINT reports tying specific strikes and munitions to TB2s and their distinctive MML payloads. European defense officials have watched these results with a mix of disbelief and frustration. While Turkey's drones have been combat tested in five theaters and exported to over 30 countries, Europe's flagship Eurodrone project remains stuck in prototype assembly. The first Eurodrone flight is not expected before 2026, more than a decade after the TB2's combat debut. The UK Protector program, based on a US airframe, only began UK flight testing in 2023, and it remains years from full operational status. French patroller drones, after years of delay, entered service in 2023 and have yet to see export or combat on anything approaching the Turkish scale. The numbers tell their own story. Turkish drones have flown hundreds of thousands of hours in live combat, destroyed hundreds of armored vehicles and air defense systems, and shifted the outcome of wars. European rivals, by contrast, remain years behind in both operational deployment and export reach. This is not just a triumph of engineering, it is the result of a defense ecosystem built for speed, adaptation, and independence. And at its center stands a new kind of industrial leader, one who listens to the battlefield, not just the boardroom. On a cold morning, February 21, 2024, the KAN fighter jet lifted off from the runway outside Ankara. The twin F-110 GE-129 engines roared to life, carrying the first fifth-generation stealth fighter ever built and flown on European soil. Turkish aerospace engineers watched as Kayon banked over the steppe, its radar absorbing skin and internal weapons bays a direct answer to decades of dependency. Test pilot Barbaros Demirji later described overriding a stubborn sensor fault mid-flight, knowing that defense ministries across Europe were tracking every second of the maiden sortie. France and Germany's future combat air system and the United Kingdom's Tempest remain years from their own prototype flights. Yet here was a Turkish jet, already airborne, with production lines set to deliver two aircraft per month by the end of the decade. The pace is not limited to the skies. Along the coast, shipyards are pushing out 31 warships at once, a build rate unmatched in Europe. The TCG Anadolu, the world's first operational drone carrier, is the centerpiece. In November 2025, a TB3 drone performed a short deck takeoff from Anadolu's angled ramp then returned for an unassisted landing. No European Navy has fielded anything close. Anadolu's flight deck is designed for swarms of unmanned aircraft, including the Kizilelma unmanned fighter, which completed its first live fire test the same year. Each vessel in the new fleet is equipped with Turkish-developed Genesis combat management systems, integrating homegrown radars, missiles, and electronic warfare suites. Anadolu and Genesis together rewrite what naval air power can be. These milestones are not abstract. They are the work of Turkish Aerospace and its partners, who have transformed the country's industrial base from license assembly to original design. Every new prototype, every ship delivered, is a signal. Turkey is not waiting for permission, nor is it following Europe's timelines. The result is a defense arsenal that is not just modern, but uniquely tailored to Turkey's strategic needs. Built at home, tested in real conditions, and ready to deploy without a call to foreign suppliers. In 2024, Turkey's defense exports soared to a record $7.1 billion, reaching buyers in 180 countries. The client list now includes traditional partners in the Middle East and Africa, and NATO allies in Central and Eastern Europe. Poland, Romania, Bulgaria, Slovakia, and the Czech Republic have all signed contracts for Turkish drones, armored vehicles, or naval systems, often choosing Ankara's offerings over established Western suppliers. The appeal is clear. Turkish gear arrives faster, costs less, and comes with fewer political strings attached. Outside NATO, the scale of Turkey's export ambitions is even more striking. In July 2025, Indonesia finalized a $10 billion order for 48 KAN fifth-generation fighters, selecting the Turkish jet over the Eurofighter Typhoon and the French Rafale. 
Indonesian officials cited rapid delivery timelines and the promise of technology transfer, two advantages European competitors struggled to match. This deal stands as the largest single defense export in Turkish history and a warning shot to legacy manufacturers across the continent. Yet for all the headlines, the story is not one of absolute independence. Turkish systems still rely on imported engines, radar chips, and encrypted communications modules. The Kayon's first production run uses American F-110 GE-129 engines, and export versions remain vulnerable to shifts in US or European export policy. Those dependencies create leverage for suppliers and supply chain exposures that can become strategic pressure points. Ankara's answer is a clear roadmap toward autonomy. The TF-35000, Turkey's first indigenous fighter jet engine, began ground tests in May 2025. Full integration is targeted after 2030. Internal development plans also aim to eliminate foreign-sourced avionics and semiconductor chips in later development blocks, but the timeline is ambitious and the engineering and certification risks are real. As Turkey's defense sector eyes $15 billion in annual exports by 2030, the question is no longer whether it can compete with Europe, but whether it can close the final 20% gap before the next round of embargoes or supply shocks. The world is buying Turkish arms in record numbers, yet the drive for true strategic independence remains a race against time. Europe's defense future is not just shaped in Brussels, it is being built in Turkish factories, one indigenous innovation at a time. As global supply chains fracture, strategic autonomy becomes priceless. Turkey's example forces a question. Who truly controls their security and who is just renting it? Share your thoughts below.